My name is Rafaelita Aldaba. Um, allow me to uh, uh, welcome and thank our, our speakers. Uh, we are so fortunate to have with us uh, Dr. Mia Michik. We also have um, um, Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Ra Yofemio, Yofemio Rasco Jr., Dr. Um, Shin Horn Chen, and uh, we have another, we have a third, uh, a fourth, <laughs> a fourth speaker, Mr. Uh, Ezel, uh, whom we've heard uh, this morning uh, as well. Um, we, we are given 20 minutes, so four speakers will be given um, 20 minutes each. Um, apart from being your moderator, I'll also be presenting um, uh, the Philippine strategy with respect to Industry 4.0. And um, for the final speaker, Mr. Ezel, he would have uh, 10 minutes. And then we'll have uh, 20 minutes for uh, Q&A. And, uh, and then we'll uh, wrap up uh, the session. OK. So um, yeah, maybe I could start by uh, doing the presentation for the Philippines. So today's topic, the uh, fourth industrial revolution, is very important. It is disruptive as it is reshaping every industry faster than ever. Even Silicon Valley is surprised by the speed and scope of change today. What should we do? That would um, endure even as so much gets disrupted. This is the question that all the presentations will be addressing this afternoon. So I will start by uh, sharing with you the Philippine New Industrial Strategy, which is called uh, IQS, Inclusive Innovation Industrial uh, Strategy, which focuses on innovation to help us prepare for Industry 4.0 and future production. Okay, so um, we've heard this morning that uh, with uh, the fourth industrial revolution, there will be new production techniques, new business <coughs> models that would transform our global production systems. Um, with uh, these new technologies, they would be driving more uh, distributed and connected value chains. There would be <coughs> reshoring, nearshoring, and other structural changes in the global value chain. And because of this, there would be uh, a demand for certain skills and capabilities um, at each stage of the global value chain. Uh, for developing countries like the Philippines, um, this may add another layer of complexity to the challenging tasks of uh, developing globally competitive industry. Uh, and it might put at risk uh, the viability of low-cost manufacturing and services exports as a source of growth and uh, development. Now, um, let me sh just share with you uh, the current uh, situation in uh, most industries in the country. Um, some are still in 3.0 and many are still actually transitioning from 2.0 to 3.0. For instance, in the ITBPM industry, which is a major um, sector in the country, con um, it, uh, it is actually a major uh, exporter, and this is one of the reasons why our uh, why we have a surplus in terms of services exports. We are very strong in voice. In fact, Philippines is number one in voice, um, and uh, we know that uh, with AI, with ro with robots. Um, we can, these uh, workers in the BPO sector could easily be replaced. And hence the strategy is uh, for the sector is to um, <coughs> find ways to move up the value chain. Uh, move from uh, voice to non-voice, high value added uh, sectors such as knowledge process outsourcing. And this is actually the uh, direction where uh, the industry is heading. Now, in terms of the uh, manufact, the, the rest, uh, the two other sectors that you can see are um, in the manufacturing industry. In automotive, we're still in the completely knocked down um, part, uh, or what we call CKD assembly, and we um, are actually manufacturing um, parts, large plastic and metal body parts, as well as strategic parts. And uh, this 
it is for this reason that uh, we have uh, formulated the comprehensive um, automotive uh, resurgence strategy program. It is really to uh, capacitate and um, uh, allow the development of car, car parts manufacturing in the country. And then we have uh, electronics. Um, and again, um, electronics comprise the bulk of our exports. And when we look at um, the different uh, products being uh, manufactured and exported in the electronic sector, true, this is a high-tech uh, sector, but mainly our uh, exports comprise of semiconductor manufacturing services. Um, and if we look at what stage of the global value chain we are in, we are actually in the labor intensive back end uh, assembly process and test. These are low value added uh, activities. And so um, for the electronics uh, sector, the, the direction in view of uh, Industry 4.0 is really to go towards the design part and uh, as well as to go into the um, electronics manufacturing services. And for agriculture, um, well, the story here is a little bit different. Um, agriculture, the agricultural sector is actually lagging behind and uh, we're still in the mechanization phase. So um, there's this uh, study from the World uh, Economic Forum 2018, which uh, assessed the readiness of 100 countries uh, for future production and harness full potential of industry 4.0. There are four classifications. You have the high potential, leading, nascent, and uh, legacy. And guess uh, where the Philippines fall? We are in the legacy group. Uh, we have a strong current base, and that's uh, uh, due to our strong <coughs> electronics uh, uh, sector. But then uh, we are at risk for the future. But other, there are other countries like <coughs> India, Thailand, Mexico, Romania, and <coughs> Turkey um, in the same uh, classification or in the same group. And um, based on the study, the conclusion was uh, the Philippines uh, is at risk, and we are we are not ready for um, the future of, uh, uh, we're not ready for the future. Um, and there are three major reasons were given. And one is that uh, we have a weak uh, technology base. We have um, weak human capital. And uh, the third one is uh, our infrastructure. And so um, the, the, the study focuses uh, its recommendations in terms of uh, um, putting our efforts more on innovation and, um, and for us to be able to uh, upgrade and reskill our workers, uh, upgrade our technology platform, focus on innovation as well as um, good governance. So it is in view of all this that uh, we formulated our new industrial strategy. Of course, apart from Industry 4.0 uh, and it's uh, uh, both the challenges and the opportunities, we know that uh, uh, poverty in the country is still a major issue. And so our, um, our mantra is really uh, for inclusive innovation industrial strategy. The overall goal is to grow and develop globally competitive and innovative um, industries with strong uh, forward and backward linkages. We are building the innovation and entrepreneurship ecosystem. This is very important to allow us to upgrade and develop new industries. And we are removing obstacles to growth. This is uh, also very important to enable us to attract more investments. And with more investments, we'll be able to create uh, new jobs, more and better jobs. We are also strengthening our domestic supply um, and value chains. And again, this is important to enable us to deepen our participation in global value chains. And, um, and so um, our, our industry is actually characterized by um, a lot of uh, missing linkages, by a lot of gaps. And so what we want to do is uh, to link together manufacturing with agriculture and services. And the role of the government in all this is to act as a coordinator and a facilitator, especially in addressing coordination and market failures and uh, creating the proper environment that would allow the private sector to grow and develop. 
So there are five major pillars. Um, these are new industry clusters, um, focus on human resource development, MSME development, innovation and entrepreneurship, which is at the heart of this uh, strategy. And in here, we're uh, focusing our efforts in terms of uh, strengthening government, academe, industry collaboration, particularly in uh, pursuing market-oriented research that would address or that would solve uh, societal problems as well as industry needs. And then, uh, very important is ease of doing business. And as you can see on the top, uh, we have the triple helix, uh, academe, industry, and government. And the buzzword really here is connectedness, given the many gaps uh, and, missing, uh, and the missing linkages in our uh, structure. And um, this is our framework. Um, it's competition, innovation, productivity nexus. Uh, with uh, more competition, this is going to drive more innovation, more entrepreneurship, leading to um, high productivity growth. And as you can see, the arrows are bi-directional. <coughs> And based on, um, with respect to the status of uh, innovation in the country, based on the Global Innovation Index of 2018, we rank number 73. And I've um, indicated here uh, the different areas where, um, uh, where we are scoring uh, low, very low. Uh, these are our weak points. We're not able to produce uh, creative outputs. Um, our also in terms of our human capital expenditures on R&D, expenditures on um, education, the Philippines is lagging behind. Also in terms of uh, market sophistication, indicators, ease of getting credit, and so on. Along with um, it, um, indicators for um, innovation linkages, as well as our ICT um, infrastructure, we need to do a lot more. And um, so this is what we want to happen, is to bridge the gaps in innovation and entrepreneurship. Um, like what I've said, um, currently, the Philippine innovation and entrepreneurship uh, ecosystem is characterized by um, many missing linkages and players, as well as the lack of connectedness. And we know that we need to strengthen the collaboration among government, academia, and industry um, in order for us to build a connected country. We need to strengthen our business and policy environment in order to attain a more inclusive and sustainable growth. And at the same time, very important is the um, creative talent pool. We need to create a critical mass of, our, uh, of this talent pool. And all this together could lead to our ultimate objective, which is poverty reduction. So uh, this is our vision. We uh, would like to create an inclusive innovation and entrepreneurship um, ecosystem. What we envision is uh, a Philippines where um, there's strong connect, uh, collaboration. We, we want a connected country with strong business and uh, policy environment, having a creative talent pool where uh, there are facilities for um, incubation of innovation and where there's strong academe, industry, and government uh, collaboration. So how to do this? Um, we've identified six major elements. Number one is on um, pursuing innovation policy and commercialization. So we are uh, putting up uh, the hard and soft uh, infrastructure that are necessary in order to accelerate the commercialization of research. Of course, incentives would play an important role. The enabling environment has to be there in order to um, uh, attract more uh, investors and more innovation. Number two is the building of industry clusters. Uh, we need to position innovative industries for rapid growth. Later on, I will show this, uh, what these industries are. Funding and finance, again, um, very important. Especially, we need to attract uh, venture capital and the uh, angel investors <coughs> and improve our access to capital. Number four is the building of an entrepreneurial <coughs> culture in the country and providing more support, not only for um, micro, small, and medium enterprises, but as well as for our uh, startups. And then for government, academic industry, the need for us to um, strengthen the environment um, that would make it more conducive for innovation to take place. And the last, uh, last item that you can see, but very important, is um, human resource development for innovation, 
uh, ready workforce. We need the technical and the management talent uh, to be uh, developed. And um, in, within the government, um, this is also part of our strategy, is to promote collaboration and closer coordination uh, among these different government agencies that are, um, that are mandated uh, to uh, perform uh, not only the conduct of, uh, of uh, research, but as well as uh, uh, the agency responsible for the physical innovation infrastructure, which is uh, the DICT. And then you also have, uh, apart from DOST, you have the DA, Department of <coughs> Agriculture, as well as CHED, um, because these are the three major uh, government agencies that are providing uh, research grants. And then uh, for um, uh, HRD, we've also included TESDA for the training and uh, DOLE for our labor policy, along with uh, DEPED. And then NEDA is there for our innovation policy monitoring and implementation. Um, the DILG, as well as our local government units are also um, important along with the Department of Finance because we need um, innovation support, fiscal and uh, fiscal support in particular, and we need the approval of the uh, Department of Finance to do that. And um, and so this is uh, um, one major recommendation of uh, the roadmap. It's uh, the establishment of regional inclusive innovation hubs or innovation um, centers. And uh, we look at this uh, regional innovation hubs as uh, the cornerstone of our new industrial policy, the IQS, and they lie at the heart of uh, our economic transformation as they would bridge the gap between academe and industries. As you can see, uh, the players are all identified on the chart that uh, you can see on the slide. These are the lo local innovation and entrepreneurship uh, ecosystems that we want to build all over the country. And it's not just <coughs> about the, the building of physical infrastructure, but um, more important is the creation of <coughs> virtual, uh, the connection of the different players with, um, with each other. And uh, so you have the universities, you have the funders, events, R&D and uh, science and technology parks, innovation hub, accelerators, incubators, and so on. Even the, the enterprises are also there, large MSMEs and the startups, services providers, along with uh, government. And we are focusing our um, efforts in terms of developing these industries, electronics, auto, aerospace, chemicals, ITBPM and agribusiness. So um, here are the priority industries. And uh, I've also uh, identified in here uh, the different um, activities within each sector. Um, we have here electronics and uh, electrical, like what I've said. We are moving towards uh, um, from the semiconductor assembly processing and testing. We would like to uh, move up the global value chain uh, by uh, pursuing more R&D activities. I see design, that's for uh, the designing of uh, chips. Since we don't have a wafer fab uh, in the Philippines, we cannot produce, we cannot manufacture the chips here. But uh, the alternative way is for us to move into design and uh, also to go into the manufacture of advanced products using um, uh, technologies like Internet of Things, uh, robotics and so on. We're also moving towards uh, auto electronics. I think this was mentioned by uh, Jaza this morning, aerospace electronics, consumer uh, electronics. And as you can see, these industries that we've identified are all uh, interconnected. Electronics and electrical, automotive, aerospace parts even, and ITBPM. Right now, the connection is very weak. But what we want to happen is uh, for us to be able to do the design, to do the R&D here in the country, and at the same time, be able to manufacture those products that were designed um, here in the country. So there's automotive. Again, uh, we're focusing on auto electronics. We're also looking at uh, advanced driver assistance systems components, engineering services outsourcing, which is a segment of the um, R&D. Um, in the electronics industry and uh, as well as in other, uh, other industries. Um, we're also looking into uh, electric vehicle. 
Um, and then for uh, ITBPM, uh, the move towards uh, ESO, engineering services outsourcing, towards data analytics, legal process outsourcing, health information management, and so on. And for agribusiness, which again is a very important sector because most of our regions are actually still relying on uh, agribusiness. And there's a need for us to transform our regions from traditional agriculture to more modern agribusiness. That's the only way by which uh, we will be able to solve um, um, poverty in the country. So we're looking at high value crops like mangoes, bananas, nuts, coffee, cacao, coconut, and uh, other high value crops. <coughs> And then these are the next set of uh, industries. As you can see, there, there is, it, it's actually a combination. We're not focusing only on the high-tech industries, but also on uh, some of these are still the labor-intensive uh, sectors like shipbuilding. Uh, we have furniture, garments, construction, transport and logistics, iron and steel, uh, the development of parts and components, as well as uh, the chemical sector. So um, in our industry upgrading, we are focusing on closing the supply um, and value chain gaps. Uh, we are also focusing our efforts in terms of uh, accumulating lab some labor intensive activities because a lot of these are still missing. And uh, as, we, as we try to develop our industries, they would still be needed and so they are still there. So in the short run, what we want really is to have a balance, uh, have a good balance of semi-automation and uh, labor-intensive work. Like for instance, in, in the automotive sector, there's still, uh, there are opportunities still for us to develop metal casting, go into forging, machining. There's a high demand for machining, not only in automotive, but as well as in other sectors like aerospace parts. And uh, in the assembly and mid inspection uh, segments of the auto industry, th this would still require um, labor intensive work. And um, so that's, that's on the supplies. So uh, that's on the demand side. So now looking at the supply side, um, we, we present here uh, a profile of our um, labor. Um, and right now, uh, what is our unemployment rate is 5.4%. And um, on the other side, you can see the characteristics of the unemployed. Many of them are actually uh, um, in the high school as well as in the college level. 42.6% have high school uh, uh, level, while 36% have college degrees or have reached uh, college. And um, looking at the structure of employment, which is uh, in the middle, 57% are actually in uh, the services sector. 22.4% in agriculture, fishing, and forestry, and 19% uh, in industry. But um, what, uh, looking at our STEM graduates, which we would be needed given our Industry 4.0 uh, goal, uh, we see a decline in the number of our STEM graduates uh, between 2015 and 2017. From uh, a share of 37%, this went down to uh, 30% in 2017. Mostly the graduates are going into business uh, administration and education and they now comprise 49% of our total graduates. And um, so this uh, I'm down to my last, uh, to my final slides just to um, uh, emphasize some uh, points. Uh, number one is that uh, the Philippine industrial uh, policy, the IQS, is innovation focused. We are trying to link together manufacturing with agriculture and services. And then second point is uh, um, our innovation and entrepreneurship strategy, which focuses on, um, um, on developing creative and connected communities um, through strong government academe industry uh, collaboration. Uh, uh, and pursuing basic and applied research that would provide solutions to societal issues and industry needs. And then third point is uh, uh, the building of regional inclusive innovation centers to bridge the gap 
between innovation and <coughs> entrepreneurship. And it is in these regional inclusive innovation centers uh, where new industries would be coming from. They would drive uh, industry, the development, particularly of new industries. And last point, um, I have here a lot of things, but um, maybe just two points from, uh, from these uh, five points. Uh, the low skilled, the low educated, and routinized jobs are the most vulnerable to the adverse effect of technological change. And so it's really very important for us to um, be able to provide the safety nets through innovation and R&D with education and training. And this is exactly the strategy that uh, we are um, pursuing. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>
efforts made, tweakering, you know, wages and prices, etc. And <laughs> so we will try to then build uh, the workforce uh, and the market for uh, large enough for the industrial uh, production. So we will have industrial economy that will be driving uh, production and employment <coughs> and, and trade. And then we will move to, to services. And the services that we were talking at that time were mostly non-tradable personal services that were rather plugged by very low productivity as well and efficiency. And there were many scholars talking about how that shift will also slow down the growth and development because, you know, uh, the work in McDonald's and type of haircut industries, etc., is not going to really bring your productivity up. And as you move, uh, from industry to services, it will actually then uh, have consequence in how fast you will be able to, do, to grow. Right? And, and many countries in, in Asia actually have been talking at the, at the last years of 20th century uh, 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 and, and early 20, 20, 21st century about premature uh, pre deindustrialization. Right? India in case, and we're talking about how only 16% in that country, of course, of GDP is linked to industrial sector and everything else is in between agriculture that is not that is not really based on, on large efficient production but small small um, substance uh, agriculture and services that is again not at the leading edge of, of services but is is located in the back offices and and what uh, Fita was talking about the voice and and type of, of these in, uh, in these industries so as we move on, now we have to discuss what is this next phase? What is the 21st century uh, in the development of a country, right? And, and, and we have heard wonderful presentation this, the presentations this morning, and many things have been, have been said uh, ab about this, this future that we are looking at. The, the, I was looking, when, when approaching this, um, I was looking at, you know, what, what is the type of economy that we are building, right? It, it's not agrarian, it's not industrial, it's not services, it is something else. And I decided to call it smart economy. I don't think it's uh, the best possible expression. Uh, it's very similar to what people now uh, have uh, decided to call uh, the smart cities, right? But the base is the same. The base is really the digital, digital, uh, structure uh, that uh, uses information and communication technologies, the connectivities to, to, to improve operational efficiency, connectivity with citizens and services delivery. So this is the base, but, but it's not sufficient to really define it. And so, so the overlay of that is, is the purpose. Right? Because the purpose changes for the future, and the purpose changes from creating just economic benefits to something richer. And that something richer is, a, is this over, uh, over, over, over um, lay, uh, or, or interaction of economic, social, and environmental. Right? So that with, with this, we need to combine really um, a, a innovative and adaptive governance uh, framework uh, that promote innovative solutions for pursuing sustainable development. And when we talk about sustainable development, very often people will give you the three circles that somehow in the middle will overlap. And then they will say, oh, OK, when you have uh, overlapping of economic, social, and environment, this is your sustainable development. It's not, ladies and gentlemen. What sustainable development is a three over overlapping uh, circles, right? Because you, you can't have the rest that will be operating without really thinking uh, of, of all three aspects at all times. And so the question then is, if we are building that type of economy, um, what do we need? And a number of times already uh, we mentioned the role of government, right? And, and I'm going to be talking about that mostly. But um, uh, <laughs> We try to then say what what will be the role of policymakers. I'm very I'm very glad that uh, Celia in the in her introductory remarks uh, uh, did mention evidence-based policymaking. So we are expecting policymakers to be really looking at evidence when they create decisions and when they act. 
Now, from my own experience working with governments, which is the short for policymakers, right? It doesn't happen often, right? Because they are very, very uh, busy by chasing very short term um, uh, goals, right? They, and, and we do have visions and we have strategies and we have all of that, right? But the daily work really does not um, give a, a chance for these people to pause and to say, what will be the implication of my action now? Right? So when we talk about future that we want, I'm actually saying, um, it's, yeah, maybe, but we will have future that is based on the actions that we put today. Right? And often these actions are actually uh, coated in very nice visions and strategies, but are actually not uh, based on implementing that. So when, when you put like characteristics, yes, we need forward looking governments and we need governments that will share practices and this and that. Uh, this, is not, this is not for smart economists, that's for any government. Right? That's, for any, that's nothing specific for that. But let me, let me then turn into the base of that smart economy. And we have heard uh, from um, you know, m many um, speakers this morning much in a, in a much more erudite way about this, this technology monster. I'm a trade economist, 20th century. I don't even handle the terminology right. You will have speakers later on uh, that will do that much better. But uh, what we have pulled together uh, for one of our papers are really different sources um, of studies that we're looking of what are these examples of frontier technologies. And, and then, uh, of course, they're not uh, uh, completely uh, the same, homogenous. Uh, they, they're driven also by different uh, objectives in their research. Uh, but there are some common things that, that appear there. Uh, first and foremost, it is this artificial intelligence that, that by Stephen was defined very nicely this, this, this morning. Then we have, of course, Internet of Things, uh, big data or data analysis, 3D printing that uh, reoccur in, in all of these, right? And so these are the type of technologies that will be leading, that will be leading um, the, the development of smart economies. But what is, what is common, what is common in all of those is really um, <coughs> the, the ingredient that is called data. Yeah? And so uh, the one element that we don't discuss or we haven't discussed this morning uh, yet or today yet is, is really how the, how, how, how the factor of ownership of the main ingredient of development uh, actually uh, impacts. The, the achievement of, of that, right? Because we know that in agrarian economies and the shift from agrarian to industrial, <coughs> what you had was really the ownership of land and reform of land ownership was a driver in getting it more efficient, right? Then we had ownership of physical <coughs> capital that again was very instrumental, right? Then we, as we were moving to services, we were going to go and move into more ownership of knowledge, right? But here, really, it is data. Right? And, and it is, number of times it is said that who is gonna own data will be the ruler of the world, right? So we, we I think, I'm, I'm not gonna dwell on that, but I think this is one of the points of discussion that needs to be that needs to be examined uh, in more in more depth, right? Now, um, these this this set of technologies, frontier technologies, um, open, uh, and I think it's visible from the presentations of Vita also in the in, in the strategy that is being put for the country. Uh, all these opportunities uh, were very nicely fed into the actions or, or, or planned actions of the of the governments. So we do have uh, you know the opportunities in the in the proper economic space that they will be creating much better productivity, efficiency, and economic growth. They will be allowing better delivery of public services because if the government does latch onto using this frontier technology, it will be much better in providing these services. It may, and this is a big, big uh, sort of conditional uh, verb there, it may lead to less 
in uh, inequality to better equality and inclusiveness, but that is also one of the, as you will see from my next slide, it will be one of the major risks and and, and dangers of the frontier technology. And we haven't actually talked about environmental situation, but from the, from the smart city solutions uh, that, uh, that, 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 that use fr you know, frontier technologies in, in terms of improving, uh, improving uh, environmental, ecological uh, uh, aspect of, of this living, I think uh, that can be spread across uh, the economies at large. I only have a few minutes left, so let me rush through this. Risks, uh, and, and I, do, I do want to stay positive, uh, right? But I have to talk about risks and dangers as well, because we live in real world and these are, uh, these are important. Now, of course, impacts on jobs, and we had the wonderful presentations already, much was said. There are we, we act, what I want to say is that we don't actually know what's going to happen, right? Because the the, re, the the research in this area, right, is 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 the typical economic research because it says on one hand you will have that, and then on another hand we will have that. So we will destroy jobs and they will create jobs. What will be the net effect? You know, as in economics, is an empirical issue you can't predict. So it will end up being seen, right? But maybe it's not as bad as that. That's 20th century economics, right? Maybe 21st <coughs> century economics would allow us to predict better. Why? We will have artificial intelligence to do it better than we can, all right? So maybe we'll know better. But what, for, for that, what we need to prepare is really, and, and, and that's what I want to stress, th stress that, uh, is really uh, impo importance of education, right? It is not that we need to invest more in <coughs> education that we have. Ladies and gentlemen, we need to rethink education completely, right? Uh, uh, my grandchild, if I have one, um, will not be working in any of the jobs that I know about today. Right? So the education is not anymore, as I was preparing for it, I'm going to be an economist and I will be working in these sort of jobs 30 years ago, and I'm doing it now. Right? It's not going to be predictable. You will be learning for something that will last you maybe five, 10 years at the max, and then you will have to reskill. And so what you need to learn in your primary education is how to learn efficiently and how to be adaptable and how to work with machines to produce value, not against machines, all right? So this is what we are looking at and, and, and that's why we need to work on really preventing the, f the furthering, the deepening of technology divide that we are, we are talking about today. Uh, everyone is talking about internet access, broadband, etc. Really, I don't care if you don't see your cat favorite movie in three seconds like that, right? But I do, I do care if you can't access your, your, your job data, if you can't work from home, if you're a mother and you need to be connected so that you can keep the job and that you create, that you create um, a, a, a sense of fulfillment and, and productive contribution to the society, right? So governments need to invest much <coughs> more into that. They need to co-invest with private sector, right? Uh, I don't want to, 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 to talk about my organization. We work a lot on that and we can actually advise as need be. But another big thing about how to close the, the technology <coughs> divide or how to prevent it getting into the, into the chasm that it is going into is really invest more in research and development. You can see the differences between the countries. I did not put the Filipino percent for the, for the reason. Um, <laughs> and, um, and 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 this because this is where the knowledge will come out from, right? Research and development, and it needs to be done together. I mean, academia, business, and government. Uh, yes, we have learned a lot from government-supported uh, research through NASA, and and everything that we have today is basically from the government-funded research. Right, and my other favorite author, uh, author is, is 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 talking about that. But in future, it's not going to be like that, right? Because simply, we will not have sufficient resources for that. 
Lastly, the, the, the third set, and I have one more minute, uh, <laughs> um, the third set of risk is really related to, to, to this ethical and moral issues. Um, uh, there are so many of them, right? Uh, but what I want to, 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 to talk about, again, based on, on Harari's work, mm -hmm. is really that, that these, these, um, these risks uh, do come out because we neglect to study human beings. We are studying machines, artificial intelligence, technology, and all of that. We are getting less and less in tune of what human beings are about, how do we actually function, and how can we sustain our species to remain there, or are we going to be in competition with super quantum, what it is called, computer, uh, that will be doing everything, including empathy, better than us. Right? So we need, to, we need to be looking into that. For that, we have come up with, uh, please allow me 30 seconds to just read off my slide. Um, we, we, have, um, we have six type of policies, right, uh, that I have uh, uh, no time to explain in, in depth, right? But I want to focus on, uh, and, and they were talked about, about uh, already. Uh, I think what we mentioned about regulation and presence of government is very important, but it cannot be regulation from the 20th century. It cannot be. It has to be innovative regulation, right? Uh, uh, also, what, what I, I must say, because of, of what, what I do, is creating a platform for a, for a multi-stakeholder uh, um, inter, in, interaction and, and, and work. Uh, and this is where the co-creation of knowledge uh, and the co-beneficial activities will actually come out from. And so the organizations like PIDS and, uh, and uh, other think tanks, et cetera, in the region uh, are absolute uh, necessity to, to help governments uh, work, work on that. Um, I do have another two slides that, are talk, that talk about the importance of trade as an economic activity in all of this. This is because um, by education, I'm a trade economist, so I have to say something about trade. But I would rather not, because, because that would lead me to be very pessimistic about the, the prospects of trade in, in the current global environment. And I don't want to, to, to take any of the optimism that we may come uh, through, through our other deliberations. So, so let, me, let me skip those and just uh, finish with the with few uh, takeaways uh, from, from, from this. So we know that, that Fort, uh, what it is called, Fore, for, for, uh, Fort Industrial, fi Fire, Fire, okay, sorry. Um, uh, it's a new thing for me. I, I call it, uh, you know, for Fort Industrial Revolution, anyway. We can't stop it, of course. It's like water coming in, uh, but, but we would want to put some dams and we would want to control the pace, right? Uh, but the more we control and slower we let it go, we will lose the benefits and opportunities, right? So the balancing of the speed, a uh, balancing of the shocks with the, with the opportunities for, for benefits is really very important. And that's why the governments need to work uh, together to do that, right? We need to be realistic uh, and, and put the, the, the uh, much more um, policies that will take care of people rather than sectors or industries or jobs, right? So we need to be looking very seriously in North, North European model of, 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 of social, social welfare, where we want to really support uh, the, 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 the humans to enjoy the benefits from that, right? And then, of course, uh, we want to, to uh, further these policies uh, to be shared by countries. What I have liked this morning um, um, and this afternoon so far is a mention, is a mention of, of, of regional cooperation. And, and you were talking about regional hubs, but I understand this is within Philippines, not within the region, right? And, uh, and uh, I have to say, um, this year somehow, uh, through all of this, maybe maybe wind blowing from Washington or wherever, countries are getting more and more inward looking. 
I don't hear about regional cooperation. We will establish community and we will share this and that, right? Um, including ASEAN, right? Um, and, 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 you know, on Monday I was sitting with a board of investment of Thailand. They were building strategy 4.0 4 and, and investment 4.0 without even mentioning ASEAN community. Here I don't see much about regional cooperation. My question is, are we really going to do it on our own or do we need others? Right? So on that one, since my time is really up, thank you very much. I'm happy to note that I share something in common with Dr. Mia. We have the same favorite author, Noah uh, Yuval Harari, and I have my own favorite quote. <laughs> Biology enables, culture forbids. I think this is very uh, relevant in uh, today's discussions about uh, the potential impact of policy on uh, technology and innovations. The main theme of today's activity is preparing for the fourth industrial uh, revolution, but my concern is more basic. I would like to make sure that you and me will live long enough <laughs> to experience the joys or frustrations of the fourth industrial revolution. I will talk about food. I have uh, four simple messages. Number one, we have made serious blunders in agriculture when we apply the principles of the industrial revolution, the first three industrial revolutions, to produce food. Number two, we can make it right by learning from mother nature. Number three, the fourth industrial revolution gives us the tools. And lastly, and this is the good news, chains will have to come first from us. So it is within our control. Uh, but before I uh, proceed, I need to assure you that I have no connection with placard-bearing <laughs> nature activists. <laughs> I'm also not inclined to judge the present government's uh, food policy. My concern has a wider time span than the current administration and a wider <laughs> geographic span than the Philippine archipelago. I advocate taking inspiration from the beauty and harmony of nature, discovering nature's secrets, and using them to create a food system that will not only be profitable, but also environment and consumer friendly. The problem of today's agriculture is not confined to the Philippines, and it has a common beginning with the rest of the modern world. It started when we apply the principles of the first three industrial revolutions to produce food. Some of these are specialization, mass production, synchronization, standardization. If you read Albin Toffler, he said all of this. From industrialized countries, this mistake was spread to developing countries through a system of technology transfer starting in the 1960s using international research centers such as uh, IRI in the Philippines. Let me clarify, the industrial type of agriculture we practice today was an honest mistake, not some conspiracy and not without benefits. This agriculture and food system was able to save billions of people uh, from starvation. The industrial revolutions called for food systems that specialize on a few crops and animals that are, that are efficient and with good handling uh, characteristics. The result, more than 50%, some estimate about 80% of global food calories depend on only four major grain crops, rice, wheat, corn, and barley. You are familiar with this? Industrial farming in areas that are suitable for large-scale production and have access to modern supply chains now provides the planet 
with highly processed products such as the one used in fast food restaurants. I think this is a very good symbol of what uh, the modern food system is about. But this is our own version. <laughs> in the Philippines, up to 80% of food calories depend on only one plant, rice. Today, the Philippines has a food security crisis precisely because of her excessive dependence on rice. But why is the world so dependent on grain crops to begin with when there are thousands of species of edible plants that are more nutritious? Because grains are easy to mass produce, store, and transport. It's good for agribusiness. When we cannot produce enough rice, we can get it from Thailand, Vietnam, or Cambodia cheaply and fast. If the source knows his business, he will remove all the nutrients by thorough drying and polishing because nutrients interfere with the ability of the product to remain fresh. And this is done by the rice mills. Uh, the source will also fumigate it so that it will come to our shores without bok bok. For industrial farming, we needed fossil fuel to produce the fertilizers, pesticides, and fuel for the highly intensive system required to improve land productivity. It was convenient that the industrial capacity developed during two world wars could be used to produce fertilizers and pesticides. Tractors and mechanical harvesters made it easy to do large-scale farming. Sensors and drones of the type we have seen this morning, help technology-oriented farmers manage hundreds of hectares of single crops. A sophisticated <coughs> global supply chain was established with the help of information technology. It became cheaper to transport food from other continents to Manila than from Mindanao to Manila. With better access to information technology, Policymakers in Thailand perhaps know our food situation better than our own policymakers. The same trends can be seen in animal agriculture and aquaculture, which are dependent uh, on a few species produce, produced in large scale using the principles and tools of the Industrial Revolution. Today, we see novel systems such as hydroponics and protected cultivation applying the same uh, principles. Essentially, large-scale monoculture is the legacy of the first three industrial revolutions to our agriculture and food system in general. In the Philippines, monoculture is practiced in rice, coconut, and corn that altogether occupy more than 90% of our arable lands. So what are the negative consequences? The Philippines, in particular, has a high poverty incidence in the farm sector because monoculture of rice, coconut, and corn does not generate enough profit for the farmers. Our farmers tried to copy industrial farming, but they did not do a good job. Number two, everywhere monoculture is practiced, there are high external costs in terms of pollution, loss of biodiversity, resource depletion, and global warming. And lastly, of greater concern to all of, you, all of us here in this room is the increasing global incidence of chronic diseases such as stroke, heart attack, and diabetes. Today, one of three people on this planet suffers from obesity and overweight. In the US, the leading practitioner of industrial farming, two out of three uh, people are inflicted with the same prob problem. In the Philippines, four of the top six causes of death can be traced to consumption of rice and other refined grains. Of course, there are other risk factors associated with chronic diseases, but our food preference is a major contributor. Industrial farming has shaped this preference. The food that the global supply chain gives 
to us is not necessarily the best for our health and nutrition, but they are the most profitable for agribusiness. So what is the alternative? Well, if the problem is monoculture, the alternative is polyculture. Doesn't take much, right? <laughs> we need to diversify combining crops with animals and applying nature's principles such as re recycling, symbiosis, as well as economy in time and space. Many studies have shown that polyculture, even in its simplest form, is more productive and less damaging to the environment than monoculture. So how can polyculture produce food at a scale that can feed the world? Mother nature is our best teacher. Uh, but this is more difficult than many of us may think because it requires deep understanding of the soil, water, weather, plants, animals, microbes, economics, politics. It may require equally complex farm architecture and inputs and product supply chain. This is the reason why 40 years since the term polyculture was first used in literature and thousands of years since simple versions were first, first practiced by farmers, it remains in the fringes of commercial agriculture. Talk about polyculture today, and uh, the first thing that comes to mind is subsistence farming. This should not be the case. There are very few practitioners. Agriculture is a dynamic and interdisciplinary field. And it's, and it's so knowledge intensive that it requires the best of us. But apparently the best of us was not good enough. So we took the easy, simple path towards monoculture. Science was not of much help in shaping the current food system because the underlying principle of polyculture, ecology, is a very young science. You may be surprised to learn that is younger than chemistry, physics, and even computer science. Computer science dates back to the 1940s. Ecology dates back to the 1970s. So it's a very young science. And the modern mind is rather late in recognizing the ecological and nutritional rationale for adapting a polyculture system. Because we have not understood the science, it has not been easy to transfer technology and scale up the simplest polyculture practice, such as this, rice fish farming. You'll be surprised, this is at least 1,000 years old, but it has not been uh, spread to the rest of the world. Nature has many secrets, and we are just beginning to discover them. Let me highlight three of them. One, there are more beneficial creatures than harmful ones. Number two, cooperation, not competition, is the more important force that shapes the biological world and, in fact, humanity as a whole. And number three, biological diversity is correlated with productivity. These natural principles are exactly the ones that operate in polyculture. I have no doubt Dr. Klaus Schwab, the guru of the fourth industrial revolution, would not hesitate to accept the concept of polyculture because he calls for cooperation, he calls for synergy of biotechnology, information technology, and engineering. But the greater challenge to agriculture is utilizing cooperation in the biological world to maximize productivity without sacrificing sustainability. Our present monoculture technology prepares us to grow rice, rice, and rice in the same field year after year. But suppose you want to include carabao, rice, duck, mung bean, azola, indophytes, beneficial insects, biological control agent, fish, and mushroom, in a production system while producing alcohol from the same system to fuel your machines. Uh, well, it's not easy because no one has done it. It is not as simple as combining expert knowledge from monoculture systems. 
because polyculture is based on favorable interactions which should be considered in designing a workable farming system. The fourth industrial revolution promises technologies that can deal with the problem of understanding and optimizing complex systems. We need this to mainstream uh, polyculture. Specifically, I see the value of our deepening knowledge of genomes as a tool. Sensitive sensors may allow us to decipher the language of plants. Blockchain technology can make it easier to establish complex production systems and supply chains. Fortunately, our tropical environment, which is otherwise hostile to monoculture, is in fact favorable for a polyculture system. We are endowed with the needed diversity of crops and other biological resources, which are the raw materials for any polyculture design. Now let's talk about what we can do as, cons as consumers. We need to understand that market-oriented farmers will not grow something we do not want to buy. For this reason, it is essential to recognize that we consumers are the final actors of the food supply chain. We are the market force. We need to change our eating consumption habits from one that was shaped by the first three industrial revolutions to one that can be made possible by the fourth industrial revolution. From one that gave us chronic diseases and deteriorating environment to one that will provide better nutrition and health and a better environment. Let me close by reiterating that the solution to market-driven farming problems does not lie on farmers or policymakers alone. The consumer is the key. By our food preference, we should tell the farmers and agribusiness people what to produce. They should not tell us what to eat. Well, in summary, if you want to go through the four messages, we made serious blunders. Number two, we can make it right. Number three, the fourth industrial revolution gives us the tools. And lastly, the first step will have to come from us if we want to achieve the kind of transformation we need to survive the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, thank you for the invitations. Uh, especially, uh, my, I come from the uh, Chunghua Institution for Economic Research, which is a non-profit think tank uh, in Taipei. We are not part of this network, so I'm honored to be here. So uh, today, I would like to focus on specific topics about what we learned from the I, uh, IoT application at the social <coughs> sphere. Um, before, that, uh, before I present the two cases, I would like to touch on the so-called the concept of digital economy and digital transformation, and then show some implication, especially for the issues of how to uh, change the so-called ecosystem of uh, science and technology innovation in order to harness the so-called the trend toward uh, digital economy. Actually, uh, the Asia as a whole, especially East Asia, is, uh, has been a strong player in the global ICT sectors. Even the Philippines has been a very strong good player in the global value chain of software. Um, but what we did actually was the so-called R&D and innovation for production and exports. We also try to tap into the global value chain. Now, we like, now we would like to move forward by harnessing the so-called economic transformation and of the digital technologies. Uh, I think these kinds of transformation is not just about uh, promote a sector to pro produce the ICT products or service. In fact. It has uh, uh, much to do with the ICT innovation at the societal level. It's more 
about the so-called innovative applications. So that's why China come up with the terms IoT plus. IoT can plus anything. So it's not just about uh, you know establish a new sectors to uh, uh, promote the, the production of these ICT products. Um, even it's come to the existing sector, there may be some far-reaching effects in terms of the reconfiguration of the global value chain and the ecosystems. So we, we should deal with what will be happening in the existing sectors. So my focus will be the application of IO, IoT. Actually, this is not new. It's been here around for years. The problem is that uh, they are still evolving and uh, fancy front end stages. Uh, some we probably may not be uh, full comprehensive to what to do with the IoT's application and the design of business models. So uh, before my present, uh, case studies, let's just talk about economic transformation. Um, the this part actually is, uh, is given by Professor Martin <coughs> Friesman. He tells us how the ICT sector itself has been evolving. Before we had this ICT device, and then we have telecom service. Um, before the end of the uh, 20th century, we have this internet platform. For the next, uh, for the years <coughs> to come, Probably we will see evolving internet, internet plus and next internet. But I would like to draw your attention to the the definition given by two British scholars. They draw, they say that the digital economy is not just about ICT sector or digital sectors, which produce ICT goods and service. Now they we can come across this kinds of a uh, nanoscope of digital economy. Uh, it could be platform economy and sharing economies. More importantly, there will be digitized economies. This means that uh, no sectors, no spheres are outside of this transformation. So the, you just mentioned the so-called precision agricultural things. Um, this will have uh, some implication for policy making. Back to Taiwan, the government tried to measure or pre make some prediction about our progress in the digital economy. But they adapted the uh, sector-based <coughs> approach. And they may be able to manage to calculate uh, the value created out of these digital sectors. They may be able to do something about uh, what's happening in Taiwan in terms of a uh, sharing economy. But we could not did well come up with a broader picture of what's happening in, uh, in the other sectors. So that's why we, uh, we need to have a broader picture about this digital economy. Um, so, if you keep in mind these kinds of uh, developments, then we need to take a broader perspective into these kinds of digital transformation. It's about new development model and innovation trajectories. When you come to the so-called new technologies such as IoT, Industrial Point Four, and Society 5.0, um, championed by the Jap Japanese governments, it's more about innovation for applications. Yeah, you also, quite often these kinds of applications is domain specific. So you need to have a cross fertilization, even solution oriented software, hardware and integration. I remember the professor in your university actually tried to come up with his own solution for the traffic uh, management. Uh, more importantly, because the, the sectors, uh, is, is the ecosystem of the sector are still evolving at the international level, your national innovation system got to be more internationalized than it is now. Yeah. 
especially when it comes to the uh, cultivation of the entrepreneur startups. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, you cannot see the right hand side. This is um, give you one example uh, about what's happening in the mainstream sectors. Can you just look at the two sets of uh, spoils? Can you see the differences? This is the traditional one. Before you need these kinds of components, which are different patches. So you need a sewing machine. And then uh, this is a unique labor intensive process. But nowadays, most of the spoilware come up, look like this. One piece style. So the footwear industry come to resemble the textile industry. You know, my f uh, uh, friends actually is uh, working together with the Nike closely. Suddenly they realize that they face competitors from nowhere. Because Nike working up with the startup to come up with their IoT solutions. Yeah. Especially this also involved the reconfiguration of the global value chains. I remember Stephen uh, told us this morning, GE managed to consolidate the advanced engine into 12 parts. So your roles in the global supply chain may diminish. So people talk about the short supply chains thanks to digitization. Because they can do parts of consolidation digitally in the design phases. They can also try to come up with a business model print at the point of assembly and consumption the so-called decentralized manufacturing. Now the Taiwan and uh, Vietnam are major players in this food uh, sport way of the global value chain. But we are at the stake of these kinds of digitization uh, transformation. Um, my friends, uh, he, you, he was a former CTO of uh, uh, G, uh, GM come up with this uh, kinds of uh, pre map, V-shape map, how to uh, 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 make money from mega trends. Yeah, we, when we work for the global supply chain and management, and uh, global value chain, we tend to focus on the so-called micro innovation. But for the company want to pioneer new business, Quite often, they start with uh, identify potential economic opportunity and so <coughs> societal needs. They manage to come up with some business and technical analysis to uh, identify potential product, service, and even critical technology. With good R&D teams, you come up with a show starter technologies. You got to integrate with available technology, and then. And the way to, in the way to do that, you got to remove show stoppers, which quite often has much to do with the so-called social interface, uh, which is defined as an important interaction in the process of commercialization and marketization. This may not be good enough, especially AI innovation is, or, or IoT innovation is domain specific. So you had to find an alternative route for benefits. We call a uh, scale out. So you still you had to integrate available techno uh, technology, remove the show stoppers. Some of the application may be unexpected. So that's, and in addition, when it come to the issue of the IOTO applications at the societal level, uh, I would like to draw your attention to the so-called broadly defined of the customer space. You are familiar with the terms of demand, uh, which is related to pain points or moment of truth. But uh, according to our uh, studies, we find that you need to deal with uh, consumer behavior. Especially don't fertilize technology without consideration of consumer behavior. Uh, you also have to deal with a social interface. Uh, this is uh, 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 Eric Anderson, uh, the vice president of Foxconn, actually defined as uh, smart city 
as the so-called uh, smart city enable new behavior which redefine urban spaces. I think his definition echo our views. Let me just give you one example. Darkless uh, bike sharing. You know, it's, it's, it's surged within two years. And now, in certain city, you come up with these kinds of uh, graveyards. The, key, the problem is that when they design a business model, they neglected behavior and social interface. You know, your competitor will throw your bike away, and then you throw his bike away. So it's the end of this price of, you know, unused uh, sharing. So that's why it's very important. It's not just about industry policy. When you're going to promote innovation at the societal level, you have a need to have a broad scope of the so-called innovation policy. So that's why this morning some uh, audience actually argue that we need to write regulatory regime. Yeah. Then we give you some cases of IoT applications. Uh, sorry, again, this, this is a, a, a kind of startup called U Park. Uh, you know, normally when you are in, in Taipei City, some people may try to keep their parking space with these kinds of uh, cones uh, in the legal or illegal ways. Yeah. And this U Park come up with this IoT locks. So you can unlock this, uh, this kinds of, uh, uh, these IoT locks are simply by digital passwords. And right from the beginning, they, they promote these kinds of smart solutions for online of night sharing of parking spaces. They tell people that you don't need to block your uh, parking space in these ways. You simply use the lock. And they were smart enough to start, to, to start from the roadside parking spaces because it's relatively easy for people to access these kinds of roadside uh, parking space. The problem is that when they want to get in, into the complex, uh, residential complex, they got to engage with new stakeholders, like the management committee of the, build, of the residential complex. You even have to let the uh, security uh, guard feel relatively comfortable to let outside, uh, to, to car from the outside to get inside the, the, the buildings. They also have to deal with uh, legal issues, which is social in, uh, interfaces, yeah. Another case is, is the electronic tolling connections in Taiwan. You also have your ETC solution, yeah. The only difference is that in, in, in Chinese Taipei, we have this multi-land free flow tolling uh, solutions, and the usage rate is up to 94%, which is highest in the world. And you see the, the performance, yeah, which is good enough. They wanted to find a market for scaling up, so seeking export to some of the ASEAN countries. And this is the ETC solutions in town. We don't have this entry gate. Instead, we have this uh, gantry, tolling gantry. Every 30 kilometers, you can find these kinds of gantries. And then there, is no, there are long gates here. So. Um, they try to uh, work with uh, Vietnam uh, to, have in, to establish a pilot size in Vietnam. <coughs> Initially, they want to scale up their operations in Vietnam. The problem is that even they have the international awards, it's difficult for them to, you know, to have uh, some good performance in international outreach. Partly because of the, the fragmented ownership and operation of the national highway in some of the ASEAN countries. Your national highway may be divided by, or operated by different companies because through of these kinds of BOT projects. So it's not possible to have a, a single uh, you know, bidding system. Even you come to the, uh, Southeast Asia, they, they still need the domestic tolling service operator instead of one from the outside, yeah. 
Um, but they can have an uh, extended application outside the, the superhighways. So I use the term ETC is not just ETC. You see, this is the smart parking. They made for large company like TSMC. It's a kind of access control. Yeah. They also use this kinds of uh, ETC for uh, uh, seat for the flow management inside the cities. So every 30, with every 30 kilometers of the countries, you can calculate the, the speed between the two countries. You can use this as, as uh, on a vehicle tracking. So they can be have a lot of applications outside the electric, uh, 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 super, super highway. The problem is that the regulatory regime need to change. Yeah. And I also give them an idea to have a reverse application of ETC. You see, uh, normally we have the ETEC on, on the card. Then if they want to establish a solution for mobile <coughs> police patrols, they ha can have a ETEC on the individual uh, outpost and with the portable RFID inside the card. So you can know where your police car is. Yeah. So in a sense, the, the company solution is not just ETC. Initially, it's the ETC because the by regulation is ETC. But they can become an access control solution provider. They can even become a vehicle-centric logistics for management and commerce. You can imagine that if you can you know, go through the drive-through of the McDonald's, you can pay, make your consumption payment simply via the, the, the ETC mechanism. And in, uh, back to the Chinese Taipei, every major seat, uh, uh, seaport have this kinds of uh, uh, solution for truck, yeah, flows. So actually this is RFID and the uh, OCR solution. It's a mini version of the ETC. So you can use it in a different way. So I think this is the one example of a scale out. So that's, this is my last slide. If we want to march toward the digital economy, we face new keywords for innovation. Before we focus on production and export, now it's about production plus innovation application for solution. Uh, before we focus on the so-called value chain, now we have to deal with the ecosystem, which co quite often involve multi-stakeholders. We, before we focus on the production interfaces, nowadays we need to right regulatory regime. So it is important to have a right social interfaces. So it's not just about technological innovation, it's a kind of a compound innovation, especially when it comes to the business model and regulatory regimes. So this will require we change the way in which we innovate and inter act with the changing innovation ecosystems. So I would like to refer to a statement made by the United States. You cannot have cluster of technology innovation without social and behavior change. Yeah, thank you. Thanks and hello again. Uh, Stephen Izal from ITIF. Uh, so when I was coming to Philippines, I was asked if I would give a presentation to the Central Bank of the Philippines on policy principles for fintech or financial innovation technology. Um, so I'm going to condense that 20-minute presentation into a very quick one and say that uh, everything here is based on a report my colleague Alan McQuinn wrote on policy principles for fintech that surveys the current landscape of global financial technology innovation and suggests recommendations for policymakers. So what we're talking about in financial technology is the application of the digital technologies we've spoken about like AI, blockchain, mobile devices to create new business models that will enable financial institutions to cut capital cost and remove intermediaries. In particular, we're talking about four types of fintech applications. First, payment and transfers 
including how people transmit money, both in payments, where money is exchanged for something of value, and transfers, where money is transmitted between individuals and organizations. A good example here is the use of blockchain for international remittances. Right now, when an individual wants to conduct an international remittance of money, uh, it takes actually about a half dozen different banks to get that done. And one loses about 12% of the value of the transaction as intermediaries take their cut. Um, when in a world of blockchain technology, however, uh, we can eliminate virtually all of those intermediaries, uh, which is why one study found that uh, banks could save 15 to $20 billion each year by using blockchains to cut infrastructure costs associated with cross-border payments. Uh, so that's one example of how FinTech will be used. Uh, others include uh, new forms of personal financial tools to help people make better decisions about their personal finances, including taxes, investments, retirements, and estate planning. Uh, forms of alternative financing, uh, such as crowdfunding, peer-to-peer -peer lending, and new types of business fi financing, and new innovative insurance models. So what's really the vision for the financial technology world of the future. And to us, what's really happening is that banks and other financial companies are experiencing their Skype moment, so to speak. So if you think about it, prior to Skype and other voice over internet protocol applications, making international low distance calls was expensive and you had all these intermediate cost. Now, what we have the ability to do is to leverage uh, uh, the, the same types of internet protocols uh, to essentially transform what was before an expensive, dedicated, single-purpose network into one that can be a general-purpose technology giving way to cheaper uses. So essentially, what we want to uh, have happen is to allow internet protocols to do for banking what Skype did to telephone, what Uber did to taxis, and what, ads, what uh, WhatsApp did for messaging. Essentially talking about a fundamentally more efficient, lower cost, more globalized, more consumer friendly uh, model for financial services provision around the world. I'm gonna go through again uh, these slides very quickly to, to uh, uh, speed this up. A couple key points to make here. When companies want to introduce new financial technology innovations, they tend to face a number of specific barriers in the fintech sector specifically, including access to data from incumbent financial institutions, access to government regulatory data, uh, bricks and mortar regulations, and complications around standards and standards processes. So one challenge is that access to data can be a barrier to competition. Uh, so especially in the United States, a number of innovative financial technology companies need access to banking networks, um, especially if they are denied banking charters. But unfortunately, some financial institutions prohibit third-party applications and services that actually help consumers manage their finances from accessing data, uh, their customers' data on their behalf. Uh, so essentially, they're using these restrictive platforms to prevent innovators from getting into the market and innovating. This has been a challenge in a number of countries. In fact, the German Banking Industry Committee uh, recently ruled that restrictions on internet payment services are actually a breach of German and EU competition law. So we need a concept of bank neutrality. One important point to recognize is that because governments already regulate financial services, there's actually no reason not to require data portability and require application <coughs> programming interfaces or APIs to allow consumers to pull data into third-party systems. And in fact, the UK Treasury has established an open banking working group that developed a standard for open banking in which APIs are gonna be allowed to use to provide third parties with wide ranging access to bank platforms. So it's imperative that governments require their banks to uh, use these APIs to open up consumer uh, account, payment accounts for appropriate licensed innovative service providers.
And in the US, we've made a lot of steps to encourage open APIs uh, for government data sets, such as complaint and mortgage data, and our Consumer Finance Protection Board uh, has a complaint database with API capabilities uh, that facilitate uh, the provision of open access to government data as a platform for financial innovation. As we talked about earlier, one of the most important things for regulators to do in this space is to balance risk with the need to support innovative business models uh, and services. So what we're seeing is a number of countries around the world, in fact 20, uh, experiment with regulatory sandboxes for financial technology. Regulatory sandbox being a framework set up by a financial regulator to allow small scale live testing of innovations in a controlled environment under the regulator's supervision. The objective is to enhance innovation, competition, consumer benefits, and financial inclusion, and do so in an environment where there can be an active and open dialogue between the innovator and the regulator uh, to assess uh, how this technology and business model is playing out in the marketplace, uh, ensuring adequate uh, safeguards for consumer data and financial protection. Um, the United States started this in the year 2012 when we introduced our project catalyst from the Consumer Financial Protection Board. Uh, the United Kingdom followed with the Project Innovate of the uh, Financial Conduct Authority. There's actually been four cohorts now of Project Innovate that have brought over 200 innovative uh, fintech uh, companies to the market in Britain. And we've seen a number of other countries put in place this kind of model. Uh, the point is that it's not about all regulation or no regulation, it's about the appropriate type of regulation to support innovation in knowledge and innovation-based industries. Uh, finally, uh, just a couple of final points because I want to be respectful of time and move on to what will be a much more interesting conversation with the panel. One thing we see across advanced technology industries, whether it comes to communications or transportation, is that there is an a tendency to try to regulate up to the current regulatory environment, which, however, was generally produced for an older set of technologies or business models. And you often see incumbent firms trying to say, well, the Uber or the Airbnb have to meet all of our regulatory requirements. But to us, the goal of regulation should not be parity of regulation, but rather parity of protection. And so while incumbents want to regulate entrants up to their level, which seems fair, the reality is that n new types of businesses don't always require the same type of regulation because they can incorporate new forms of uh, transparency and consumer protection into their business models. So for instance, uh, Uber rates the driver and they rate the customer. And so there's a feedback loop of, 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 of transparency and knowledge sharing that actually you know, removes some of the regulatory role that was needed in the past. Similarly, for FinTech, whether it comes to entrants or incumbents, we could see a similar trans, uh, 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 trajectory uh, uh, in terms of creating transparency. So in peer-to-peer -peer lending, lenders could rate borrowers and vice versa. There could be transparency on paying back. Um, a key point is that whatever the regulation that's applied in FinTech, it should apply equally to incumbent firms and to the newer firms. Finally, just to conclude, it's important that regulators remember that finance is a platform industry that actually affects the competitiveness of all downstream sectors and industries in the economy that are using innovative financial tools. The sector fundamentally depends upon the ability to move data globally across borders, and we should seek greater international harmonization among countries uh, in terms of routing transactions and money laundering. There are over 13,000 innovative fintech companies in the world. They promise uh, much greater benefits uh, for consumers and uh, countries should put in place a regulatory environment to make that happen. Thank you.
administration. It goes beyond this administration. And it's similar to the other roadmaps that uh, we've been formulating together with the industry. So um, this uh, roadmaps that uh, we've been doing, it's not just the work of DTI or the work of consultants, but it's actually um, um, the work of the many other government agencies, academe, uh, industry, and the many stakeholders all over the country. In fact, it took us a year to uh, prepare uh, what I have presented because of all the consultations and the validation workshops that we've carried out from the Luzon, Visayas, down to Mindanao. We went there twice and uh, we'll actually be launching uh, the roadmap this October 2. Um, <laughs> and I would like to invite all of you. And to the, to the other question on as, as to um, the bandwidth, uh, the physical infrastructure, ICT that we need, we are working together with the DICT. In fact, we will be uh, signing a memorandum of agreement uh, uh, on uh, October 2, and this would cover not only DTI, DOST, but as well as DICT, NEDA, uh, CHED, uh, DepEd, um, as well as, uh, did I mention NEDA already? So there are seven agencies uh, who will be uh, signing uh, the MOU. And after the MOU, we are hoping that um, we, it could be uh, it could be transformed into an executive order just to ensure that uh, um, this collaboration uh, with respect to promoting innovation and entrepreneurship in the country uh, would be institutionalized. So um, DICT is also in charge right now of um, looking for the third player, and hopefully, once um, once we have the three players, uh, there will be more competition and. Uh, um, and at the same time, government is the ICT is also going to invest, um, and I believe in the infrastructure that is going to be uh, put up. Uh, in Facebook, in fact, is going to be the first client, and um, we're hoping that by 2020, this is already going to be operational, and that um, the the far the, the far flung areas would have really access to internet, and that we would be able to bring down um, its costs. Any more uh, questions? Yes. I am uh, Sok Pansuela from uh, Pakisama International Confederation of Family Partner Organizations. We are a product of a revolution, just a political revolution, 86 when our organization was formed. And we are a proponent of polyculture agriculture. We've been there since the 80s until now. And um, when, when you said, the consumers a king we just hope that the consumers will buy uh, the products of a polyculture agriculture but there is of course the issue of price um, when uh, your orga our organic products are priced very high because it's very costly to, to uh, produce them when you have all the policies of government incentives, finance, uh, not there supporting farmers going into uh, polyculture, agriculture. So just would like to uh, ask that question. How do you view the consumers becoming a real power uh, in this case, no? in, in transforming our monoculture agriculture to polyculture agriculture? And a question to Fita. Uh, DTI. Is this even considered in your IQ strategy uh, that this transformation uh, from monoculture to uh, agriculture and therefore who will be the key players in the regional <coughs> uh in this kind of transformation? Are the agri-cooperatives in there or we're still basing our hope big business uh, uh, or very much into the monoculture uh, agriculture so this would like and then third question for our friends from how is open banking possible in this kind of transformation how would that help uh, we pin our hopes in the future of agriculture to the young farmers who may be more internet or cyber savvy uh, in dealing 
with agricultural future, but they're not there. They're not moving towards agriculture. In fact, they are moving away because agriculture equals misery or poverty that has been in their minds. So there's, uh, and that's quite a challenge to us. Well, we're discussing this. Our colleagues are meeting uh, young farmers, and we were only able to gather six young farmers to discuss the Magna Carta for young farmers. <laughs> and uh, so it's quite a challenge so, among our members, even our members. You know, so so uh, how can the financial system also help in this kind of transformation, this open bank system that cyber and uh, perhaps our friends from Tai Taipei has some models. Uh, uh, we are we are um, uh, we idolize the the innovations in Taiwan and uh, Taiwan's agriculture. We, we love to go to Tai to Tai Taiwan to see how you develop your your agriculture to to an extent that uh, you know it's an envy to many of our farmers. Please. Uh, well, I'm happy to note that I have an ally here in the room. For a while, I thought that uh, uh, I'm uh, alone in having this interest in agriculture uh, because I, I realized that uh, a lot, well, a great majority of uh, Filipinos, or maybe even on a global basis, cannot relate the fourth industrial revolution to, to farming. Uh, well, the the problem that I tried to describe is the uh, uh, typical <coughs> chicken and egg problem. Which comes first, the, the farmers producing <laughs> or the consumers uh, buying? I hope you understand what the problem is. If the farmers listen to me and they start producing a, a wide diversity of food crops, who will buy them? Because the consumers uh, like to buy rice and fish or uh, McDonald's and uh, Jollibee. So who is, going to, who is going to buy? On the other hand, uh, if, if the consumer starts you know, uh, preferring a more diversified diet, well, you have that problem of the uh, supply. Because the farmers are not used to producing a diversity of food, then the only thing available in the marketplace is rice and a few others. So uh, who will make the first step? Well, uh, taking the first step entails risks. And I think the consumers uh, are more prepared to take risk than farmers. Our farmers are very poor. They cannot take risks. Uh, on the other hand, our consumers are more diverse. Some of them are you know, po uh, poorer than others. So perhaps uh, the, the one who, who should take the, the, the risk is the consumers who are uh, more affluent, who can afford uh, to take risk, and maybe initially can afford a, a higher price. Uh, but technically, uh, the alternatives that I, I described are actually, uh, it's cheaper to produce than, than what we eat today. Uh, but there are problems with the supply chain, <laughs> and uh, we'll have to deal with that. Uh, w what I'm saying is, uh, okay, it's a complex uh, supply chain that we're de dealing with here. Uh, we didn't have the tools before, but now, with the fourth industrial revolution, there's reason for optimism. We have the tools that can deal with complexity. Okay. Yep. I guess I would add that to me, what the fourth industrial revolution is really about is not just data, although that's a key part of it. It's about intelligence. It's about awareness. It's about the capacity to make better informed decisions, whether this is intelligent transportation systems that tell us when and where to drive or what modality to use, or whether it comes to farming and agriculture, where we're empowered with greater levels of information to make better choices, healthier choices. So. Uh, you know, in, in the United States, it's been really fascinating to see this uh, transformation of what's called farm to table. Um, I know this is more, maybe more rich world, but it, there are restaurants you can go to in Washington, D.C., and you order off a tablet computer, and you can actually press 
a button to figure out what all the different ingredients are in the meal. And it'll even show you this fish came from the Grand Banks off Canada, the mango came from a certain farm in Costa Rica, et cetera. So you have full knowledge of every ingredient and component that you're eating. And that greater level of knowledge, I think, is important to driving uh, what you talked about, which is consumers demanding change in the, the form of agriculture. Um, I do think um, some of this open banking and, and uh, systems can help. Um, if you haven't seen uh, the IBM Watson and, and Mango example, um, IBM and Walmart have teamed up to track uh, every mango sold in their stores from farm to uh, the store. Uh, a QR code goes on to the mango so you can take a picture of it and see a uh, picture of the farm it came from, how it was, was it sustainably uh, uh, organically produced. Um, also, what the blockchain really allows is the ability uh, to record uh, on a distributed public ledger all the steps that occurs uh, in, in, in global trade. Um, like, so it's being used in trade finance, uh, that payment is released as a product goes through different stages of the global production process, but it can be used as well with food. So you have a public tracking of the entire history of that food product from farm to market. And so the combination of payment and open data keeping, I think, can be transformative for the future of agriculture. Uh, I'm not expert in cultures, but I do know even that we are involved in the kinds of projects promoted by the governments. Uh, now we are promoting the so-called aquacultures. Uh, the, we try to use uh, some IoT technology to monitor the, the quality of the sea ocean, uh, to monitor the, the size of the fish inside the cage. They can use even the submarine technology to let your cage, you know, thanks to the, you know, the, the below the 50 kilometers, uh, uh, 15 kilometers below the sea level. Yeah, in order to deal with the typhoon. Um, um, but I also know some kinds of uh, uh, farmer contract with the consumers. Uh, they use uh, some idea like this, uh, crowdsourcing. So I'm a young farmer, so I, I try to work out with some uh, a group of customers. I promise at the end of the years, I will give you something which is a uh, high quality or uh, uh, environmental friendly products so that uh, you simply make pay payment to me right from the beginning. So in, in the end, uh, you can make sure that uh, you can have uh, liberty, you know, to have uh, this kinds of uh, polyculture and you can even get some financial funding right from the very beginning. Yeah, that's one way to do that. Okay. Yeah, just to respond uh, to um, the other part of the question, whether uh, agriculture is a part of the strategy, definitely it is. And in fact, uh, um, it's one of our priority industries. We are promoting um, agribusiness. Um, and we, we, as we traveled from one place to another, like what I've said, we've conducted all these uh, consultations and validation workshops. They do not know about Industry 4.0, actually. Um, but um, we are supportive of the idea. In fact, the strategy is really to move away from rice, uh, from rice alone, but to go towards uh, the high value crops, the ones that I've mentioned. And um, it also, uh, we, the, the crops that uh, we are promoting, you can plant them all together, like coconut and the cacao, or the coffee, and then together with some vegetables, because all of this would have uh, uh, some time before you, you, you need to wait. Um, uh, where will the farmer get his, uh, um, his income? So uh, we're proposing to have uh, vegetables uh, from which they could, uh, they could earn and survive. And at the same time, there are also startup uh, companies that are providing solutions to some of the problems uh, faced by our farmers. Like for example, in terms of access to finance, there's uh, a startup, uh, Cropital, which is providing uh, uh, financing. And um, with respect to the regional hubs that I've discussed, um, these are not focused alone on high-tech sectors like electronics and aerospace or automotive, but um, what we're um, envisioning is, since this, are, this would be scattered all over the country and much of the country is really dependent on agriculture, this would be uh, uh, regional hubs, re regional innovation hubs that would be centered on agriculture. I believe it, <laughs> time is up. Uh, can we have one more question or no? Uh, what were the closing remarks 
closing remarks. I apologize, uh, but uh, maybe you can approach uh, uh, some of uh, the, the speakers. In any case, the next uh, session would start at, uh, at four, 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 four o'clock, right? And um, yeah, just to uh, briefly, briefly uh, summarize what, uh, what uh, has been discussed. Well, since the morning, um, the presentations have illustrated how uh, the amazing technological pro prog uh, progress is going to reshape our lives. And like what Mia has said, no one knows exactly how this uh, future will unfold. But what we do know is that uh, the disruptive power of Industry 4.0 must be harnessed as an opportunity to design the future. Some things that we need to ponder on, will we apply these technologies to help accelerate development, improve living standards, foster inclusive growth? Will we take advantage of these uh, technologies to cut bureaucratic red tape, invest in education and training, unleash entrepreneurial energy and create new high value added jobs? It is important for us to combine the strengths of humanity and technology to build a better future for our uh, citizens. And so uh, please join me in thanking our, our panel uh, this afternoon.